Section 11 of The Sins of Hollywood by Ed Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Girl Who Wanted Work. The girl came from Atlanta, so we will call her by that name, just to mark her for identification, as the lawyers would say. Tired yet brave, she entered the great sanctum of the great producer. There was an outer and an inner office. In the outer office, nobody paid the slightest attention to her, so she walked into the inner room. Half of the walls were unpainted. On a large near leather sofa lay a man, snoring lustily with a newspaper over his face. His funny derby hat was threatening to fall off. At the desk sat a frizzy stenographer. She was sucking an orange with much smacking, and now and then took a bite, peel and all. With the other free hand, she typed a little spasmodically. She had her limbs crossed with great abandon, and wore rolled-up stockings with wild lace curtain effects. At last, Atlanta was in the presence of a great film magnate. Everything seemed eccentric, to say the least. The great man on the sofa was snoring with a struggling noise, as if he expected to die every minute. The stenographer said, without looking at the girl, Leave your photo on the desk. Is your name and phone number on the back? I beg pardon, said Atlanta. I have a letter of introduction to Mr. Junius. The blonde, frizzy-haired head turned. The stenographer gazed at the girl as if she had dropped down from another planet. She wiped her rouged lips on the back of her hand and said, while inhaling a mouthful of orange juice, wasn't you going to register for a job? Atlanta stated that she had a letter. She also asked when she might be able to interview Mr. Junius. For the love of Mike, said the girl, how should I know? There he is on the sofa. He's dead or something. He gets awful sore if I wakes him up. I've been here all day, said Atlanta. Oh, gee, in this game you're lucky if you see somebody the first week, laughed the girl, and took another bite of the orange. <laughs> I don't want to wake him up. He was small, dark-haired, with a bullet head and a low, receding brow. He looked very boyish. His trousers were much too long on him. He was bow-legged and wore a silk shirt with huge monograms on both sleeves. He had a large nose and small ratty eyes, and dangling from his ear hung a pair of goggle-like eyeglasses. Suddenly the telephone rang. The man sat up and rubbed his eyes, mumbled something of an anathema in a language that Atlanta did not understand, and he walked to the desk and answered the telephone. He did not seem to see her. He snatched the telephone receiver off and thundered, What the hell? He listened for a moment and then replied to somebody with a flow of excited and lurid language. The substance of the conversation seemed to be the impracticality of using an African elephant in an Indian scene. Golly, go to it, he snapped. Who knows the difference between an African elephant and an American elephant? I don't. Nobody does. What the hell? He slammed up the receiver and then saw his stenographer through the door. For what don't you answer the telephone? He snapped. What I pay you for here? He turned and was going to lie down when he saw Atlanta. She wore some very pretty stockings that day and very trim slippers. Well, he said, looking at her ankles. 
What do you want? Then he put on his hat. Are you Mr. Junius? began the girl. No, I'm Christopher Columbus, he smiled. Who do you think I am? I have a letter of introduction to you from Mr. Riddle, the theater man of Denver, she said, presenting the letter. He evidently could not read it. Are you one of his chickens? And he wants to get rid of you, eh? He smirked. Atlanta was so suddenly taken off her feet that she did not get time to get fully indignant. The little man's eyes gleamed with merriment over his own cheap witticism, and his ears stood out like the wings of a biplane. He shook his bullet head and the little derby hat of the fried egg type fairly danced on his head. Then he saw how the girl's lower lip quivered, and he decided to try another tack. Sit down, dear, he said. You are a friend of a friend of mine. Then he shouted out to the stenographer, It's time for your lunch, eh? Although it was in the middle of the afternoon, the girl said, Yes, sir, with a wink and left closing the door behind her. Atlanta heard a snap lock go shut. Well, he smiled and pushed his chair close up to where the girl sat. Speak your piece. Determined to succeed and to tolerate his idiosyncrasies, Atlanta began. I want to get into the motion pictures and will work very, very hard. You have a nice figure, said Junius, and looked her over. I have some dramatic experience, she stuttered. Why don't you act that way, then? He smiled. You are camouflaging, and why? In high school plays, and in... You have swell ankles and pretty knees, I think. He continued, What do you weigh? Live it. I weigh one hundred and twenty two, said the girl. As I was going to say, I, I, I want to be given a chance. It is up to you, replied Junius. You are a high kicker, yes? He held his hat high above his head, invitingly. Can you do anything for me? She asked, ignoring his personal remarks and attempting to overlook his leering glances. I told you it was up to you personally, said the man insistingly. Do you live with your mother or have your apartment? If you live with your mother, well, there's nothing doing. Atlanta could stand it no longer. She arose, trembling and disgusted. You shouldn't be so particular, <laughs> he laughed. Anybody that's been Riddle's chicken. I know Saul and his wife and family. Are you the girl he bought them squirrel furs for, eh? He was telling me. I I don't accept presents from men, and I don't know Mr. Riddle, snapped Atlanta. My mother does. Ah, smirked Junius. The old lady is gayer than the daughter, eh? This remark about her mother proved the last straw. With superhuman effort, she kept outwardly cool as she walked towards the door. Either ignoring her state of mind, or too callous to understand that he had hurt every sensibility in the girl, Junius asked, with an attempt to tighten her coat around her, Do you look good in a bathing suit, yes? Atlanta snatched her hat pin from her hat, and she held it menacingly towards him. He turned pale and opened the door. The boy was outside. Show this one out, Teddy, said Junius. She is a fliver. 
Look out! She has a hat pin. Scarcely knowing what she was doing, Atlanta found herself on the sidewalk, and as she passed the window of Junius's office, he looked out and shook his finger at her. I'll creel you all over town, he said. You, you are a lemon. Of course, the girl did not know till later that he was a member of a producer's association and that the blacklist was one of his weapons for stubborn girls with false standards of virtue. End of section 11 End of the Sins of Hollywood by Ed Roberts Recording by Chuck Williamson